All right, everyone, this is a podcast interview I recorded with Steve Hanley in a mate's flat in Manchester, February 2015. Uh, I just thought that since Steve's on a bit of a full tip right now with his book being out, I'd take advantage of that and try and get an interview. It was partly just because I really loved the last few records that he did with the group and I wanted to find out more about about that period because it tends to get not covered in quite so much detail as the earlier years. Uh, so anyway, if you want all the backstory of how Steve started with the group and the story of of those earlier years, I'd recommend getting his book, The Big Midweek, which is out now on Root Publishing. So anyway, here's the interview. Uh, apologies to the audio files out there for the sound quality, although it does improve after the first 30 seconds or so. Uh, so anyway, we start with Steve telling me about the book and how they decided to end it the way they did. That's been a bit of a criticism from people that it's too abruptly ended. Oh right. Then it just and they want to know what's happened after, you know. Yeah. But I think that's because it's sort of written like a novel in a way. Yeah. And in novels, there's either a happy ending. Yeah. Or there's a resolve, isn't there? Right. Yeah. You know where you find out where what people went on to after, you know. Right. After the big drama, but you know life's not like that, is it? No, that's right. Because we did loads of stuff from the from after. You yeah. know, we did a couple of chapters about playing with Tom. Oh right. We? A couple of chapters about the the because people used to ask me all that a lot about that at the time is the difference between working as a caretaker and being in the fall. <laughs> right. So there's a lot about that about finding your sort of way in the world, you know. But it just didn't seem right. And for the start, it would have been twice as bleeding thick. Right, yeah. <laughs> So, but imagine, it just didn't yeah. seem right to put it in the aftermath of it, you know. And and we so we came to the decision that the way the book's written, yeah, kind of tells you that you're all right now, you know, that you've found a sense of humour about it and you've sort of come to terms with it. Yeah, right. <laughs> Have you thought about you know? Would you put any of the sort of outtakes from the book on? Thought the about it. Yeah, I mean, we thought about. I mean, I'm I'm against it myself. There's oh yeah. Do you know? Do you know the no? There's like people who do it with the paperback and right. then put extra chapters in just to yeah I've seen that yeah yeah but I don't want to get the same people to buy it again just for another cup you know it's a bit it's a bit well, sleazy that I reckon well yeah, yeah but, uh, I agree with that but I mean what yeah. about just sticking them on yeah we thought of doing a yeah blog or something or I don't know we just you know we still in the middle of this one yeah it's, right you know, yeah. yeah I was trying to be really careful with the book yeah and we had it like a target. First of all, we had the people who were in it. Yeah. Which people like Craig and Bricks and Mark Riley. Yeah. I think it delayed it a year getting Mark Riley right, pretty right. much, or at least a few months. So when you say a target in terms of... If, so, so if the people in the middle... So they're the middle of the target. Right. So if they're happy with it... Yeah, yeah. That's great. Yeah. So, you know, we're careful... Because, you know, there are, there are people in the public eye and do you want to say this, do you want to say that, do you want to put that in, you know. Sure, yeah. They've got kids themselves, do they want to be reading that about, you know, the you right. know something that the, they did 20 years ago, do you know. You sure, have to be, yeah. There's a lot to consider. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then again, you've got to make it interesting as well. You can't have it too lightweight and, you've got, and you can't be too nice and you've got, you know, so it, it, this is why it took so long. But and that, So I thought, we've get them right. Yeah. Which we did, and we sent it out to the proofreaders of a Paul Bricks, Mark Riley, and Colin the Roadie, who's in it. Yeah. And they all came back with tiny little changes that they wanted, surprisingly tiny changes. Oh, right, okay. Collins was, when I work with the Paul Weller, I never heard him slag off other members of the jam. Oh, right. And... Rix's was, I never asked for champagne that night. I never demanded champagne. And these are <laughs> tiny little things that they want to change in. And uh, if that's all they want to change, well, that's great, you know. Right, yeah. So then, obviously, I'm not going to think about, I'm not going to think about what Mark Smith thinks, because if, it, if I'd thought that, I'd never have written it, you know. Yeah, of course. If I was yeah. trying to, sec- I couldn't even second guess him when I was in the band, so I wasn't going to start that. So we, we had a sort of little rule that, uh, if it affects the music, it can go in, and and especially if it's already in the public domain, yeah. which a lot of it was, right, but it's yeah. just my take on it. So that was it. We thought we'd get the 
get the people who are in it happy there's there's your first step yeah and sure. then moving out to the four fans on, yeah. the, on the mainly the ones on the website yeah so they're going to go be happy with it because they're obviously they're the first people are going to buy it yeah so then we thought get that right and then it was well how do we get, get a book about the fallout to the wider market because is it, it's, there's not enough do you know there's not enough you, oh, dra- you, you want to move it out to music fans in general as oh, well right. Yeah, yeah. So to make it like that, we did it. So let's have a story about a, a young lad growing up in a band. Yeah, and it can be any band, and it could, you know, it's not, but it could be any band. You know. Early on, you're talking about, you say producers tend to smooth the edge off my bass. It's hard yeah. to capture in the studio how I want it to sound. And did that, did that carry on being a problem all the way through? Uh, especially in the middle bit, I think. Especially with the the middle years I think right I mean what yeah. we're talking the beggars years yeah or? yeah not that I think that stuff wasn't great because it was you know the, yeah, that yeah. music wasn't great but it is smoothed out a bit but probably for the right reasons I think did you, you have know? much control over that oh, it's, a oh, little it's bit little bits and I mean it, you know there's that much music pr- produced that sometimes I did sometimes I didn't yeah generally on a whole I'm quite because that was another thing I had to do was revisit all the old albums to yeah, of course. which I'd not listened to for ten years or whatever. And I was pleasantly surprised. <laughs> was so it, you'd, had you not listened since you left? No, or? I hadn't listened. You know, right. only when uh, that car advert came on the top. Of course, yeah. <laughs> that must be the one time you've heard a post Hanley Fall song, right? Uh, pretty much, pretty much, yeah. Through. Uh, well, del- deliberately. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. Uh, what yeah, did you think of it? Did you have an opinion? Well, it? I, it's, it was part of my thing was, again, because I, that was written actually in Julia's flat and yeah. I was in the room because we did an appeal session before yeah. I left. Yeah, yeah. And I was in the room and I wrote the bass line, uh, which is a big part of the song. Yeah. And uh, obviously I never got a look in on no. <laughs> any of the money, that, the TV money or anything, no. Yeah, credit on it or so. anything so you know Mark but claims that he only got a small bit of it himself yeah well. he does yeah <laughs> we'll, we'll never know do you have an album that you think has your best bass sound on it do you have an opinion about uh, it ooh. maybe this Nation Saving Grace maybe or okay yeah, yeah maybe that's good I mean I didn't I didn't actually because that was when I was having maternity leave so paternity leave so uh, <laughs> right, yeah. I didn't actually write much on that only one song but uh, I think the ba- the sound of the bass is good on that I think. have you got a, a sort of era of the band or a song that you think is your peak of inspiration as a bassist <laughs> uh, I think there's there's a few really good eras I think yeah there's and separate and different bands and there's the Dragnet one and the Hex Induction Hour one and then there's the, the middle one yeah of course yeah and the infotainment kind of thing with Dave Bush when I think when Dave Bush joined for a while that was yeah a really creative period yeah yeah is that, that would you say that's the last great fall album yeah 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 I figured you might <laughs> <laughs> you know read between the lines yeah in the I book. would why do you think um, that album charted so high oh well it, uh, it was in that uh, there's probably a few reasons I think it was in the time of low sales for a start. You mean across the board? Across the board, low right. sales, yeah. And, it, and they, whatever they did, they did a good job and yeah. people bought it. But uh, and I think it was like a combination of it being a strong album. And I don't know, really, because it was the first one after leaving Phonogram. Yeah. So that must have been a real surprise. To like you know leave phonogram go on this little independent label. Uh, to be honest, that I don't know, it's funny that never really affected us. I mean, I'm sure it affected Mark, right? Yeah. And I'm sure it's affected finances, but yeah, it ne- never really whatever label we were on never really affected the actual musicians and the band as a whole. Oh, I don't right. think you know that's something that's if you're in the band you do your thing you do your album and you and then once you hand it over it's, it's kind of intangible it's, you, is it because with the four it's not like you're not you're not 
you're not relying on some sort of fickle pop audience. Yeah, it's you, the same people. Buying yeah, it. yeah. There's always sort of a core who'd buy it. Do you yeah. know, it's a good position to be in. I think. I was listening to some of the late appeal sessions, and when you listen to the late live stuff as well, it seems like the songs towards the end of the band became way more sort of amorphous and changeable. Yeah. From version to version, like they're very loose, aren't they? The very like yeah. Chords will change and riffs yeah, will change and things. Yeah, it wasn't. God, that last peel. I think that last last peel session I was on was pretty atrocious, <laughs> from what I can remember. Uh, quite a lot of calendar on that. Yeah, yeah. That's all right, I think. Yeah. But I mean, the, why why do you think that was? Why did the, the songs ba- mutate? So? The band was falling to bits relatively at that point. Was it a matter of no one could agree, so it would get changed and then get changed again? Or? Uh. Yeah, lack of rehearsals, lack of communication, lack of anything cohesive between everyone. Everyone was, I'm not playing, oh, Carl's, I'm not playing that bit if you suggest it. And it just got, you oh, know, it were, because he didn't play something that somebody else suggested. Oh, right. <laughs> and then. Was that aimed at certain people? Yeah. Was, oh, yeah, okay. it was just lots of infighting and, you know, a bad way to run a band. Really. So it must be odd to know that those last few albums you made there's a lot of fans that really love them yeah albums. yeah because when like we were talking about Stuart Lee and when we did the thing with him I was talking about Room to Live mm. and uh, he was gobsmacked he was that's one of my favourite albums how can you say that's <laughs> bad and <laughs> uh, <laughs> he's, he's, he's like open mouth go how can you say that's a bad album it's one of my favourites but yeah different people have got the different views that's fine but uh like I say, I tend to take it as the state of the band at the time. Of course, yeah. How it was going, who was in it, how you getting on with them, and uh, the, yeah. what, you know, not not just sort of how good the songs were. So for you, I mean, going from sort of middle class revolt up to the end, mm. are there any songs in that period that you do think are real classics? Oof. Yeah, there's a couple good ones on Middle Class Revolt, I think, M5, and... Uh, yeah. But that's another album that I think was rushed, again. It well, came... you say that you had an album that you were writing that was going well, right, and then yeah. you made you ditch it, or... Is that, is that right? Uh, we were working on stuff that's probably... It was probably for the best, but it was a bit... Because, like, we were constantly working on stuff, then me, Dave, Simon and Craig. Yeah. And we were writing stuff probably too similar in the vein to the a vein to the infotainment scam. Right, right. And then we got Carl back in, which sort of changed it all again. Yeah. And uh, then that uh, that was another a bit of a rush job, I think. Right. Middle class revolt. Do you think it would have been a better album if you'd have been allowed to just continue just, on the original course? I don't know. I can say. There's, I think there's a lot of. Bad songs on there though. Right. Cover versions of. Uh, well, you got the ground dogs. Haven't you? Yeah. Nobody liked them when they. <laughs> nobody liked their songs when they did them. What about the Henry Cow cover though? Oh man, that war. Yeah. Oh. yeah. I don't know. I don't know. No. no not. It's not for me. Yeah, it does seem in the book. I do notice. The so last that, there's how many cover versions are on the album? There must there's be three, three. Or, three or four. There's a yeah. monks one. That's the monks one. one. Shut up. Yeah, it does seem in the book the la- the highest praise you can muster for that last bunch of stuff is decent. Decent, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> do you think? Um, but we, it's behind the counter on that. Is it? Middle class of all. Yeah, yeah, that's good. That's good. Did Carl write that? Carl, just, yeah, he wrote that. Yeah. What yeah. he did he is that so he brings you the bass line or what? Yeah, he wrote the bass. He wrote everything. Yeah, really. Yeah, well. yeah. He's quite a musician, Carl. He's quite a all rounder. Because I was wondering about that with, because with everyone being writers, you do sometimes imagine that when you write a song, say, mm. all, all that means is you bring in a bass riff that people well, build that, upon. Or, that had happened sometimes, or sometimes you'd have a idea for the drums, and yeah. sometimes you. And that would get through, would it? It wouldn't get shot down. Or... Sometimes, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's the trials of working with five people. Yeah, of course. There's sometimes, as I've thought, you've got you write a song, you've got an idea in your head that how you want it to sound. Yeah. And it ends up nothing like that. Were, were there like... any songs that 
ended up fairly close to your original version or not? Uh, yeah, I think quite a few. I think Creep did it like that on that time. Creep and Old Brother and oh, okay, you know, around that time, yeah. But uh, yeah, that's the thing about being in a band, isn't it? That working. I think oh. Don't play that military drumming on that song, you know. Uh, oh, yeah. I, I hate that, but you know. Then other times people come up with something that you'd never have thought of, and you think that well, well yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There's a nice moment um, during the infotainment scan bit of the book. You're starting to be a bit disillusioned with the lyrics at that point. Well, you know, League of Bald Headed Men. And that yeah, sort of it was a. I think it was. I don't know if it was a bit of a struggle for Mark at that time, because we were up in in the studio doing the doing the backing tracks, and he was downstairs in the in the sort of lounge bit writing the lyrics. So he was sort of writing to order. You know? Oh right, okay. You had no I impression he had. It, it, I he like came it. prepared. No, no. But there's that moment where you describe him bringing in "It's a Curse." You're mm. like, oh, he goes, I've got a new one, and you go, Andy's back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did he have many more of those moments uh, after that, do you think? Uh, yeah, I think, the, what's it called? Uh, on Levitate, the, the one that was a single. What was oh, it? Masquerade. Masquerade, yeah, I think that's a great song, yeah. Oh, right, right, yeah. okay. Uh, yeah, he did, he did. He had a pretty dim view of uh, four and a half inch seemingly well it was something <laughs> I think it's quite a good song myself but it was something I, I was due, it was just an awkward moment at least that's all because oh, I they they sampled Simon and myself yeah and then they wrote a song around the samples did that riff exist on the tapes or did they make it they made it you up? they made it by chopping us up yeah oh, so we go okay. in the studio to do this song that I've never heard <laughs> Yeah, and Mark's like let's do that song let's, I don't know I don't know it. I've never heard it <laughs> do you know who played guitar on it uh, no no I don't actually Is yeah. it, I, don't, I don't fair enough <laughs> and, I um, think it might have been Edwin Collins guitarist oh, came really? in to do some late night sessions when we because you know we did it in Edwin Collins studio yeah in uh, Hampstead and I think his guitarist came in and did some sort of late night overdubs and was that over- Andy Hackett yeah oh, I was going to ask you yeah. who that was yeah I, I it was Andy Hackett yeah oh, right. yeah because he's mentioned on the sleeve and you never hear anything about him in no he was just or like, like I say there was Tommy was Tommy Crooks was like at that time not really a member but did the odd gig with us right so he wasn't on the sessions and Julia was programming and playing keyboards and doing some guitar but there wasn't really a lead guitarist on it and um, I mean in terms of you're talking about Mark starting a struggle in the 90s with Mm. the lyrics and everything were you still happy with Without it being a pointed question, with with your own creative ability in that time, no, probably not. No, oh, really, no. I ca- I I I think when I was doing that Levitate album, I come to I had this thought in my head that we've written every <laughs> we've written every riff. There's nothing left. You know, oh, right. There's nothing new left because you know everything seemed to be a bit of a rehash of stuff we'd done before. Oh, from, right. uh, no, I had my doubts then. Right, Different, right. Uh, yeah. I suppose you can't. I think that song, what's that song called? Old Gang? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's like, oh, man, we've done this, done the, a song like this 20 times. I think, <laughs> I think for me, what makes that one is the synths, though. Yeah, like yeah. The synths really yeah, take it to good, somewhere yeah. else. Yeah. But I suppose you're all there in the back doing your no, bit. But, yeah, and doing just... the same old three now. Right, yeah. Of <laughs> I've course. done hundreds of times before. Yeah, I was thinking, well, there's there no riffs left. We've done them all. <laughs> <laughs> but you you went on to write for Ark, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that well, obviously that wasn't true. That wasn't true. And so, mm. yeah, I went on to write for Ark and write for Tom. And yeah. If you sort of found. And new... I'm writing again now for. For, for Tom again? No, for Bricks and the Extricated. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Oh right, is there sort of a record in the works? Or something? Well, with it all came about because of the book, and we had the launch. Yeah, and there was twelve members there. 
twelve X four members. Yeah. Of which Bricks Bricks was one of them. Yeah. And she said to me and so what we had on that night was five guest singers. Yeah. We had John Robb, we had a f- other few other people and we had Tom and Brick said to me I'd have sang yeah so I was like well you know I wouldn't have, I'd never have the nerve to ask you <laughs> so then people people thought it was a really good night and with and there was talk of doing it again at Christmas yeah so Brick said oh, well I'll sing all the songs yeah so then we started rehearsing X4 songs and we got Steve Trafford in yeah on guitar and Paul, my brother. Right, right. So, and Jason Brown out the lovers. Oh, okay. And yeah, it's just good to. It's just taken on a life of its own. Yeah, it? I mean, do you know? There's a the thing of doing four songs, which is a bit because Mark's had ownership of them for so long, and it's sort mm. of a bit like being in your own covers band a little yeah, bit. Yeah, of course. Yeah. But it's you know, great people playing music with great people. See, so oh. just going to see where it goes. How did you end up choosing Steve Trafford anyway? Uh, he wrote me a really nice email when the book came out. Yeah. Saying that it really helped him. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah, because uh, he thought when he... Because he had a similar sort of experience to me, if you know, he left yeah. in the middle of an American tour. Of course, yeah. And he thought... It's, to read about somebody else going through a similar thing and he thought he he was losing it himself, you know, and he was doubting right. himself. Wow. When, and then we just sort of got friendly and he came to the launch and uh, yeah, he's a great guitarist. He is, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, you thought you're talking about um, around the time of Cerebral Caustic, mm. getting tired of the obscurity, the sort of cultish status of the band. Do you think mm. at any point you'd imagined that it would be just some gradual upwards progression towards no. mainstream? No, no, but uh, I think if you're in a band, that's a, it's, it always puzzled me why, why the fall didn't, I think. I mean, I, I'm not complaining. No. <laughs> I, I'd rather have been in the fall, you know, in for 20 years than a band that had a couple of hits for for two. Yeah, of do you course, know? yeah. And, yeah. And the thing about it being in people's favourite band was a great thing as well. Yeah. You know, it's a lot of people's favourite band rather than I think they're all right, you know. Yeah, of course, you know. yeah. So that was great. But, you know, there's a lot of bands who just did make that crossover. Yeah, yeah. Like Edwin Collins and like the Psychedelic Furs or, do you know, who, who sort of had one song yeah. or two songs that made it into the mainstream. <laughs> so, uh, so... It, uh, it's like in, when you're in the fall, been in the fall for 15 years. It's like, what ambitions have you got left then? Of so I've done everything here, haven't I? I've done albums that people are still buying, and yeah. I've done plays and ballets and tours and galore. So, what ambitions have you got left then, really? Well, Just that, that, so that one, that's it. <laughs> that one song that, you know, that, that crosses, crosses over, yeah. 